We'll continue tonight with our journeys of Paul. And last time we left him at Ephesus, we're going to look at people, places, events, and teachings. But I'm not going to emphasize that too much tonight. Mostly the, the people and the places is what I want us to look at. And so let's start in Acts chapter 19. We ended in verses 21 and 22 where Paul purposed in spirit that when he'd passed into Macedonia and Achaia, he would go to Jerusalem and says, I've been there, I must also see Rome. And so he sent two of them that ministered to him, Timotheus and Erastus, but he himself stayed in Asia for a season. It's interesting to take this account of Paul and overlay that with the epistles. Some think Paul may have written the book of Galatians shortly before he came to Ephesus. And it's pretty clear, it was while he was at Ephesus, he wrote the epistle we now call 1 Corinthians. And we're going to see two other epistles that are associated with Paul's journeys as we go through this tonight. But now we'll begin where we left off, verse 23. And at the same time, there arose no small stir about that way. That way is a, an expression found several times in the book of Acts referring to the gospel way, the, the thing that Paul is preaching. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. That's the way we're talking about. Now, there was a certain man named Demetrius. So, keeping up with names, notice Demetrius. He was a silversmith, which made silver shrines for Diana, and brought no small gain unto the craftsmen, whom he called together with the workmen of like occupation, and said, Sirs, you know that by this craft we have our wealth. Uh, if you ever go traveling... A lot of people like to pick up souvenirs. A lot of times a souvenir may be a paperweight or something to put on a shelf or something that, that represents that area you are from. And so since Diana was so well known and her temple there at Ephesus, these fellows made these souvenirs. And Demetrius made them out of silver. This must have been the more expensive of those souvenirs. Little images of Diana or maybe little pictures of her temple that was there, and uh, Paul's influence about that way was so great, it is starting to have an impact on the way these people made their money. Now, if you want to get folks upset, that's one of the fast ways to do it, is get to their pocketbook. When you start messing with their money, that's when they'll really get upset. Well, that's what happened to Demetrius. Now, I'm going to put under the people, which I'm also calling persons, Demetrius and Diana. Diana is not a real person. She's not a people, and she's not even a person. It was a goddess that was worshipped. Diana was the Roman name for that goddess. Artemis is the Greek name for that goddess, and Ephesus was known for Diana, as we shall see in just a minute. Well, Demetrius continues. Moreover, ye see and hear that not alone at Ephesus, but almost throughout all Asia, this Paul hath persuaded and turned away many people, saying that there be no gods which are made with hands. And that was the <coughs> occupation. And it was not only affecting Ephesus, from the school of Tyrannus, the gospel was going throughout Asia, and it had interrupted this particular business. Now, that shows the great influence Paul is having. One thing as we go through this, Luke tells us a story, but there's some backstories to what's going on, and uh, they just are intriguing, and we don't really know always all the, the backstories of what's happening. So we'll take... Luke's account, and people speculate on what may have been taking place in the background to, to cause Luke to write these things, and we'll see this several times. But it's obvious here, Paul's having great influence out of that school of Tyrannus. He'd been there about two and a half years, 
And it was an influence not just in Ephesus, but throughout Asia. So he appeals to them, and then he goes on to say, Demetrius, so that not only this, our craft is in danger to be set at naught, but also that the temple of the great goddess Diana should be despised and her magnificence should be destroyed, whom all Asia and the world worshipeth. That he mentions the world there. This is not just a shrine important in Asia, but all throughout the Mediterranean. In fact, that temple to the goddess Diana is listed among the seven wonders of the ancient world. This is an artist's depiction of what that temple may have looked like. Those columns you're seeing there in that picture, they're about 60 feet uh, tall. I think there was 127, am I right on that number? Maybe 137 of these columns, two columns wide. I mean, we talk about the Parthenon, and you can go to Nashville and see what a building that was, that replica of it in Nashville. Well, he wouldn't sit inside this place. This was so huge. I did some studies on this when I was going through engineering school and foundation studies. There was a lot of weight on the ground here. And what they did, they were afraid of earthquakes. And so they spent all this on this temple, and they didn't want it to be come down due to earthquakes in the area. So they didn't build it on solid rock. They went out onto the floodplain. And they dug a deep pit, and they covered it with animal skins down at the bottom. And then they let the, the waters come back over that with the idea that these animal skins under that anaerobic condition would not rot. It's geotextile fiber is what we call it today. And this temple was actually floating out there on that floodplain, not in water, but in that mud and silt and all that. It would float. Now, they had all kind of trouble with it. That didn't work. In fact, they weren't even right about earthquakes. The uh, propagation of an earthquake wave goes faster through a floodplain than it does in the rocks. And so they really made a mistake when they did this. But they would go to great expense just to keep this temple erected and today you can go to Ephesus and you know how he's talking about this great temple of the great goddess Diana would be said it not well there you have it one column and it wasn't always standing they cobbled that column together from remnants of columns that they found buried down in that silt it was so destroyed and it fell down in the River flooded, and it was covered with silt. A long time, they lost where it was. They, they knew it had been out there somewhere in that marsh, but they didn't know where it was. But they've rediscovered it now, and they've excavated, and they've dug up enough pieces to cobble together this one column of what that great temple at one time had looked like. So we got Paul here. Paul is mentioned by name, and so we're going to include him among the people and persons that are mentioned in the places, Ephesus, and then that whole region around about Ephesus of Asia. Now, certain of the chiefs of Asia, which were his friends, sent unto him, desiring him that he would not venture himself into the theater. They had gone into the theater, and these chiefs of Asia... These were the people that pretty much ruled that area for Rome. These were the most influential people in Asia. And I'd like to know the backstory, wouldn't you? How was it that they became friends of Paul? Now, Paul's teaching in the school of Tyrannus. He's having a great impact. And the very influential people, had come and had evidently heard about Paul and learned of Paul. And Paul talked about how he had taught from house to house. He may have been in the house of some. And they were educated people and evidently were very impressed with this man, Paul, and what he was teaching. And when they saw that this was occurring, they said, Paul, don't go in that temple. Paul was going to go in there. 
but they didn't want him going into the theater. And some cried one thing and some another, for the assembly was confused and for the more part knew not whether they were come together. Well, there's the theater. You can go to Ephesus. It's carved out of a mountainside there at the side of that city. And you can see it's quite a magnificent place. And I want you to imagine that filling up with people. These theaters were fundamental to the culture of Greece. You couldn't, uh, you couldn't go home and turn on your TV to watch TV show. What they would do, they'd have shows at the theater at nights. And people would come out of the city and gather around and watch those plays and shows and speeches and occurrences and performances and chorale performances and such and go to the theater tonight. And so it was a gathering place. And all these little cities round about would have this theater. But this was a massive one that was built there in Ephesus. Here's another picture of it. And I want you to imagine the things occurring there. Stand on that stage, look up at all those benches, and let your mind travel back to the days when Paul was there and what must have been occurring at that time. Well, now here's more of the backstory we don't understand. They drew Alexander out of the multitude, the Jews putting him forward. And Alexander beckoned with a hand and would have made a defense to the people. Alexander, who is this? Now the Jews are putting him forward. Were these Jews that had become Christians? It doesn't sound like it. You see, the Jews did not worship the goddess Diana. And maybe the Jews, here's one of the speculate. maybe the Jews were afraid. They're going to think that this is the Jews doing this. Alexander, get out there and explain to them, this is not us. We're not the ones that are going around teaching these things. Paul, he's not one of us. He's somebody different. Maybe that's why Alexander was there. But there was a lot of animosity toward those Jews. So it says, when they knew he was a Jew, all with one voice about the space of two hours cried out, great is Diana of the Ephesians. He stands up there, Alexander. He's about to explain it. Let me, let me explain this. This is not us Jews. He's wanting to explain it. And someone says, he's a Jew. And they just break out in this. Great is Diana of the Ephesians. Great is Diana of the Ephesians. You can imagine what a shout like that would sound like. I see echoes of this in our political rallies, don't you? When people start coming out with a slogan, and they'll, they'll say that political slogan over and over and over again. Like, like you know, the one, drill, baby, drill, you know, when they all started shouting that. Well, well that's kind of what they're doing here. And they continue this for two hours. Now, I've seen people cheering at football games, but I hadn't seen them cheer for two hours. I mean, can you imagine trying to say this over and over for two hours? Well, they weren't really hurting anybody. And so I guess the city officials said, let them wear themselves out. After two hours, I bet they would be exhausted. And so someone comes to dismiss the crowd now, and he almost rescues them from themselves. Well, let's put Alexander here on our list. Now, the town clerk, he would be the, uh, well, there's one translation. It's not really a translation, but they said, they call him the mayor. He would be of that equivalent in power in Ephesus. His name's not given, but he's the one that's charged with looking after that city. And so he steps forward and appeases the people. He says, ye men of Ephesus, what man is there that knoweth not how that the city of the Ephesians is a worshiper of the great goddess Diamage in the image which fell down from Jupiter. Now, don't think of the planet Jupiter. Uh, this was their god. Romans called him Jupiter. The Greeks called him Zeus. And there was evidently an image. Some think maybe it was a meteorite that had fallen down and they had taken that and brought that into the temple of Diana and thought that's a that's a sign from Jupiter sending us down an image of Diana here. And they had that in their temple. 
He said, look, this is, everybody knows how great this is. And then he says, seeing that these things cannot be spoken against, you ought to be quiet and do nothing rashly. It's really just, you just need to calm down. Well, look at this great temple. And we got the image that came down from Jupiter. Well, nobody can say anything about that. Boy, did he not understand what the impact Paul's way was going to have on this region and on that very temple. So we're going to put Jupiter here, like Diana, not a real person, but a person that the many thought it was a real person of some kind of name of a deity. He said, For ye have brought hither these men, which are neither robbers of churches, nor yet blasphemers of your goddess. Now to blaspheme is to speak against. And we might think that that means to really say something ugly. Well, Paul wasn't necessarily insulting and ugly, but he was speaking against that goddess. And the town clerk may not have realized just what all was occurring behind the scenes here. Now, he wasn't a robber of churches. That, um, that uh, temple was also a bank for the Ephesians, and it had been robbed before. And so, but that's not what these men are doing. He said, wherefore, if Demetrius and the craftsmen which are with him have a matter against any man, the law's open, and their deputies, let them and plead one another. But if ye inquire any concerning, anything concerning other matters, it shall be determined in a lawful assembly. This assembly that Demetrius had gotten up was not lawful. It was an unlawful assembly. And the town clerk saying, you know, we got laws to deal with this. They ain't got a problem. They can go get their lawyers. And we can handle this in accordance with our law. And that was very important to the Ephesians because they had a lot of independence from Rome. But if they didn't behave themselves, they could lose that independence. And so it says, we're in danger to be called in question for this day's uproar. There being no cause whereby we may give an account of this concourse. And when he had thus spoken, he dismissed the assembly. And I would think they're probably glad to go home. <laughs> you know, if I'd been sitting there saying, Great is the of the Ephesians and shouting with a loud voice for two hours, I'd be glad for someone to say, Okay, let, let's go home. And they had uh, done what they would do. So this uproar kind of ended in a whimper, didn't it? Well, after the uproar ceased, Acts chapter 20, Paul called unto him the disciples and embraced them and departed to go into Macedonia, another place we're going to name here. He embraced those disciples. He'd been with them about two and a half to three years, and so he sang goodbye. And he'd gone over those parts and he'd given them much exhortation. He came to Greece. Now, we got to learn from the epistles, what's going on? Paul had gone up to Troas. There he was hoping to meet Titus, coming back with a report from the church at Corinth. And there was a great door of opportunity open for him at Troas, but he was so distressed over not finding Titus. So he goes on up into Macedonia, either Philippi or Thessalonica, and that's where Titus meets him. And that is when Paul writes the second letter, that, or the letter that we call 2 Corinthians. So that's working in here about this time. And then he comes down to Greece. And where he actually comes is into Corinth. And he abode there three months. Well, that's because the winter set in. And you can't travel on those seas in the winter. It's too treacherous. And so Paul is wintering over at Corinth. Now, I don't have it all laid out this evening because I'm not going to go down that path with us on this study. We're going to keep the Bible Bowl kind of in focus here. But we can put together different pieces from the New Testament and find out Paul was staying at the house of Gaius. And it is during this winter at Corinth that he writes the epistle to the Romans. He wants to go to Rome, 
But he had already explained, and we see this in 2 Corinthians, how if you think it's expedient, I'll accompany this money we've collected back to Jerusalem and others with me. And evidently they thought that's what he ought to do. So now he's going to have to go to Jerusalem instead of going to Rome, but he writes them a letter, and that's the epistle to the Romans, and surely that's what he wanted to preach when he got to Rome, what's in that letter. So we've got uh, 2 Corinthians in here, and we've got Romans in here. Now, he abode there three months, and when the Jews laid wait for him, there after him, they got a plan. Remember how they had been following him around ever since Damascus. They'd been looking for ways to entrap Paul and to kill him. And now if he's got a lot of money, there may have been that incentive as well. So they're going to waylay Paul, but he knows it. And so he was about to sail to Syria, but instead he decided he'd go up and return through Macedonia. And so not taking a direct route, but he gave him the slip and went north instead of heading east. So we're going to put Macedonia and Greece and Syria among our places. Here they are. Far off to the right is that arrow of pointing in the region of Syria. Antioch is the main city there. That arrow most to the north, Macedonia. And then this arrow pointing toward Corinth. That would be in Greece. Now get ready for the names, okay? We're going to meet a lot of people here. There accompanied him to Asa, Sopater of Berea, and of the Thessalonians, Aristarchus and Secundus, and Gaius of Derby, and Timotheus of Asia, and Tychicus, and Trophimus. These going before tarried with us at Troas. I want you to notice the us. So you go up through Macedonia, and it's they and them, but you come to Macedonia, and now for the rest of the book of Acts, it's going to be us. Luke rejoins Paul at this part of the journey, and Luke is going to stay with Paul all the way until he goes on that prison ship and arrives in Rome. Luke is going to be there all the way from here to the end of the book of Acts. So we... Sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread and came then to Troas in five days where we abode seven days. Now, I'm not going to keep emphasizing that pronoun, but I wanted you to see it here and just remember that's going to carry through to the end of the book. So here's what we got. Persons, look at this. Sopater, Aristarchus, Secundus, Gaius, Timotheus, Tychicus, Trophimus. How many is that? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And Paul, that would be eight. And Luke, that would be nine. That's quite a traveling company. Well, they got a lot of money with them that they had carried. And so in safekeeping, full accountability, and also probably to protect that great treasure that they have, and it doesn't say this, but you wonder again the backstory. How did they carry that treasure all the way to Jerusalem, that great amount of money? And you'd think, well, if it was me, I said, let's divide this up among ourselves. If they take from one, they won't get all of it. They'll just get one-eighth of it, you know. And so they divide it all up, and different ones are carrying different amounts, and, uh, and they're able to then take this in a safe way and in an accountable way on to Jerusalem. So let's look at the places. Berea, Thessalonica, Derby, Troas, Philippi, places we'd already come across in Paul's story. Here they are on a map, the blue arrow pointing to Berea, the yellow Thessalonica, the red or maroon there, it'd be Philippi. The green, Troas. The yellow, that'd be where Derby was. They didn't go to Derby at this time, but Gaius was from Derby coming with them. And so we've got these places identified where Paul is going on that journey. Now we sailed away from Philippi, and I find this very interesting. It's after 
the days of unleavened bread. You know what the days of unleavened bread were? That's the Passover. Jesus had gone to Jerusalem during that Passover week. And he was crucified the Friday of the Passover week. Now, the Passover week wasn't a set date on the calendar. It had to do with the phases of the moon and the coming of the equinox. And so we find the Passover week among the Jews, it moves throughout the spring. Just when that Passover week occurs, and it's over about a period of six weeks, six to eight weeks, where that Passover could occur. <clears throat> you know what happened? On the first day of the week, following the Passover week, Jesus rose from the dead. And we can take our calendars and figure out, well, what would the Passover week be this year? And find that day in the year in which Jesus would have risen from the dead. It's not a date but it's always the, that first Sunday after the Passover week. You know what we call that? We call that Easter, Easter Sunday. Now, I find this very interesting. Paul is in Philippi on the day that we call Easter Sunday. Now, remember that. I'm going to get back to that in just a moment. Now, it says they came to Troas in five days. And then they abode there seven days. And it was on the first day of the week. Well, it sounds like they got to Troas then on Monday, doesn't it? And so they abide seven days. That gets us back around to Sunday, the first day of the week. So back this up. You've got Sunday, seven days earlier, back to Monday when they arrived. Five days, earlier that would be a Wednesday. The Wednesday after the Passover week, sounds like that may have been the day that they left Philippi. It could have been um, on the Tuesday after. It even could have been the Monday. It kind of depends on how you count the days. But we're talking about two weeks now from the time that Paul left Philippi and at the time he arrived at Troas and then waited to meet with them at Troas. And so he's meeting with them two weeks following the Passover week. Now here's what it says. It was on the first day of the week when the disciples came together to break bread. Paul preached unto them ready to depart on the morrow and continued his speech till midnight. It's just another first day of the week. It's not any special annual day that Paul is in Troas. And yet it specifically mentions to us that on that day of this week, that they gathered together to break bread. You see, you gather together for the Lord's Supper on the first day of every week. And that is what is mentioned. Well, what about Easter Sunday? You know, it didn't say a word about it. Now, I would think that if the Bible was going to teach us that we ought to set aside Easter Sunday as a very special day. What a wonderful opportunity there was here because Paul is in Philippi with the day we would call Easter Sunday and there's no, nothing mentioned about it. But then two weeks later on the first day of the week, it says, and they gathered together. That's when they gathered together to break bread. Now today, people like to elevate one Sunday over another Sunday. And Easter Sunday, sometimes people say, the most holy day of the year. But they're not getting that from the Bible. They're getting that from, from a human tradition. And God did not give us an annual day to remember the resurrection, he gave us a weekly day to remember his suffering on that cross. And surely when we gather together on Sunday morning, we're mindful of the fact 
that he rose from the grave early that Sunday morning. But I just think this is about as close as you're going to come to an Easter Sunday in the New Testament, and it doesn't say anything about it. And I think that's significant. Well, they're in the upper room, and there are many lights. Now, it wasn't lights like this. I mean, it wasn't LED lights, okay? They didn't have that. They didn't have electric lights. What would their lights be? When I think back, you've seen this on movies and such, these torches. You know, you get these old oily rags and put them on the end of a stick and light the torches, and that would be their lights. Well, you know, there'd be a lot of fumes coming off those torches, wouldn't there? And if the room is going to be filled up with fumes, how do you think the fumes are going to get out of that room? Somebody open a window. It's getting stuffy in here. And so they open the window, and the, the fumes in this room would rise up, and then they'd be going out that window. Well, that might explain what we're about to read. It says that they're set in a window a certain man named Eutychus. Now, Paul is going to preach till midnight. Well, Eutychus probably had a good long day. Well, he's sitting there in that window, right where all those fumes from all those lights are coming right by him. And uh, he does what a lot of us would do in a situation like that. He goes to sleep. I'll tell you what. I'm, I preach up here on Sundays, and it doesn't take a lot of lights and an open window to put some folks to sleep. Some folks do it anyway, and I don't preach till midnight. And so we can see how this could happen, particularly if you're sitting in that window, and the heat of all those lights and the fumes of all the lights are going, are going past you. And Paul, he just keeps talking and talking and talking. And the poor boy fell asleep, and then he fell out of the window. He said, being falling into a deep sleep as Paul was long preaching, he sunk down with sleep and fell down from the third loft and was taken up dead. They were up on the third floor. Now, I can see up a room on the second floor. They were three floors up, and he falls asleep and falls right out of the window. Well, I bet that interrupted things. So they go down on the street. Well, here we got some persons now. Luke, Luke. He is not named in the book of Acts. I got him in italics. He's there, but he's not named. But now this poor young fella, Eutychus, that fell asleep in the window. Uh, Paul went down and fell on him and embraced him, saying, Trouble not yourselves, for his life is in him. Now, it doesn't specifically say it, but it sure does read like Paul raised Eutychus from the dead. And it says, When therefore he was come up again and had broken bread and eaten, and talked a long while, even to the break of day he departed. Paul preached all night long. You thought at midnight, maybe he's about to wrap up. He went on until the morning. Now, what is he talking about? He's talking about what all he's been through. Where all he has been. How people have responded. You go back. To find Paul when he's persecuting the saints in Jerusalem. And we go back and read all we've been studying about Paul's journeys all the way up to this time. That's what Paul's talking about. And wouldn't that have been amazing to have heard Paul explain all these things. All these backstories that we don't understand. Probably a lot of other stories involved in this that, that Luke did not specifically mention. And to hear Paul himself explain all this and talk about the wondrous things that God had been doing all this time. And they at Troas were listening to him until the break of day. Well, it says, uh, they brought the young man alive and were not a little comforted. Probably both in the fact that the young man was alive, but also in the fact of what Paul had taught them. And so now we get back on the road and he went before to the ship and sailed unto Azos, there intending to take in Paul, for he had appointed, minding himself to go afoot. Well, what they did, they left Troas and went down to Azos on the ship, but Paul walked that. I wonder why he walked. I just, there's a lot of speculation about why Paul decided, well, some say he just needed to get out by himself for a little while. Maybe that was so. Maybe he was just tired of riding on the ship. 
But he walked the distance, and they came down and picked Paul up. Paul comes down to Azos, and uh, when he met us at Azos, we took him in and came to Mytilene, and we sailed thence and came the next day into Teos, that's an island, over against Teos, and the next day we arrived at Samos, that's an island, and tarried at Trogilium, that's a city, and the next day we came to Miletus. Well, here they are. Here's the places. We're going to add Asos, Mytilene, Teos, Samos, Trigilium, and Miletus. And it kind of tells you how that ship traveled. I mean, it would almost be tedious. I mean, they're just stopping and stopping and stopping. This wasn't the express, all right? He is going on the, the regular coach where they're stopping at all these ports and cities along the way. And the blue arrows there identify all of those places beginning at Troas and then going on down to the lower one that is at Miletus and uh, wouldn't it be interesting to take that travel and visit those places you know you go there and they have shrines erected to commemorate Paul's visit in these places uh, Paul he was just passing through but they're talking about it in that area to this day and I think that's significant about what impact Paul was having well Paul determined to sail by Ephesus because he would not spend the time in Asia for he hastened it were possible for him to be at Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost so that would be 50 days from the time he left Philippi wouldn't it that'd be Pentecost he's trying to get there and this ship is just going slow place at a time but he's hoping to be there in Jerusalem by Pentecost and from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. Someone must have been going faster than the boat and had run down to Ephesus and said, look, Paul's going to stop at Miletus. You all need to meet him there. They had time to get to Miletus and welcome Paul when he got to Miletus. And then we have Paul's sermon to the elders at Ephesus. And we're going to talk about that next Sunday night. We've gone far enough at this time. Look at these places, though. We're going to add Jerusalem to that list. Okay, Bible Bowl student. If you're a Bible Bowl student, you've got a lot of places to remember, don't you? So uh, you might want to make your own list of these places. Or if you've got a Bible to mark in, get a little highlighter, mark all the places that you see and all the persons that you see. Paul makes this journey. Now, I find this all very fascinating. I don't know. There's not a lot of deep theological studies and lessons to draw from this. I don't think it even mentions Jesus, or God, or the Holy Spirit in this part. It does talk about the way, but it's just kind of, it's just not a theological portion of the book of Acts. But all these people, all these places, they're real places. They are there to this day, and they're real people. And Luke is documenting all of this. If anyone wanted to find out, Luke, are, is Luke getting this right? Well, okay, go to those places. Talk to those people. They would be able to confirm what Luke is writing. There's a speculation that I give some credibility to. It just seems to fit. I don't think this is something we can know for sure. But the idea is Luke is writing all these things down to prepare Paul's defense when he stands before Caesar. Well, we'd heard about that uproar in Ephesus. Okay, I'm going to explain that. This is what happened there. Look, you can go back to these places. You can summon these people. They'll be witnesses. They'll testify. They know all about this. And it gives credibility to Luke's account to have that kind of detail, naming the people, and giving us their addresses, the towns where they're from and where they were been and when they traveled together and getting it all documented to provide a good account of what Paul had been doing. Well, now that's the, the lesson. This really didn't extend into an invitation except for this. When they gathered together on the first day of the week to break bread, that is very significant. And we want to be one of those churches. We want to be a church of Christ at Rockcliffe, 
just like they were a church of Christ at Troas. Now we see what they did at Troas. They gathered together on the first day of the week to break bread. And that's what we want to do at Rock Cliff. We gather together on the first day. Jesus said, as oft as you take this cup, you do it in remembrance of me. How often do you do it? When I'm in Troas, they were doing it on the first day of the week. And that's when we do it. And that's why we do it that way. Because we're trying to follow that pattern and take it as often as they did. Seeing when they took it gives us an idea, okay, that's when we need to take it. And so that's why we take the Lord's Supper here on the first day of every week. In all things, we're trying to follow that new Testament pattern. And we want to do it when it comes to salvation as well. And so we invite people to be baptized into Christ. That's what they were doing in the book of Acts. And that's what we want to do now. If someone's ready to be baptized, we'll baptize them into Christ. Come out forgiven of their sins and a part of God's church, just like they were here. If you need to respond to that invitation, then do it while we stand in